evening. Uh, my name is Rebecca Ewald, and I have the honor of being Shorewood's village manager for the last three years. During my time here in Shorewood, um, the Historical Society has been just an invaluable resource for me to learn about our community's past and a large variety of issues. Um, and also one that has helped me understand how decisions have come to be today and where we're going from here. Um, during my time here, we've collaborated on some pivotal decisions, um, such as the renovation of the North Shore Fire Department, the building just north of Village Hall in 2018. Um, and then in 2019, there was demolition of a private home um, at 3534 Lake Drive. Um, and following that experience, the Village Board had expressed a desire to possibly consider policy, policy options in regards to the preservation of historic structures. What was clearly evident from the comments received by my office was that there needed to be more education about where we've been in a as a community on this topic and the policy options available. It was also clear that the community opinion varied widely on this topic. Um, in early 2020, the Village Board approved an educational seminar on the process, <clears throat> pardon me, and other considerations of historical designations. Those plans, of course, were postponed um, due to COVID occurring last year and have now been resumed and have been brought to you by this three-part educational series, which is a true collaboration between the Shorewood Historical Society, the Wisconsin Historical Society, and the Shorewood Public Library and the Village Board. Um, I found over my time here in Shorewood that at times there's misinformation or at times incorrect information circulated on this topic within the scope of the community about what historic preservation means to the property owner as well as to the community as a whole. We're gonna be recording these sessions and we'll make them available on the village's website for future reference to continue the education on this topic within our community. We wanna make sure that we leave a record for others to continue the learning um, as we explore different options. At the end of these three sessions, um, participants and residents will be surveyed to determine if there's interest that's strong enough to continue assessing options and tools for historic preservation and recognition here in Sherwood. Um, as I said, I'm Rebecca, I'm gonna be facilitating the session tonight. And before we begin, I'm just gonna go through some of the ground rules um, that we have for purposes of the series um, brought to you tonight. Amy Wyatt, who is currently off screen, she's gonna be coordinating technical things for tonight, um, moderating questions in the background. For attendees, you should know that everyone is muted upon entry and will continue to be muted throughout the course of the series. We will have some polling questions that we're gonna ask you, one which we're gonna do um, just following our introductions and one that Jason Tisch is gonna provide as he gets more into his presentation. If you have technical problems, please um, put those within the chat box and put your question and answers in the Q&A box. So I'd like to introduce um, first Haley Johnson, who is joining us from the Sherwood Public Library. Sure, she has been our esteemed leader in coordination for bringing and advertising much of this series to you. So Haley, thank you for all of your time and participation in our, in our historical team. I'm also gonna introduce you to two other um, individuals, one of which who is gonna be present tonight and on standby for any questions which is Karen DeHartog. Um, Karen and her husband, John, have been in Sh a Shorewood residence since 1973. Um, Karen's worked for both the village and the Shorewood School District for 24 years, where her frequent, frequently changing job description included communications, volunteer coordination, program and special event planning. She retired in 2009 and became involved in the Shorewood Historical Society. She served as president for a number of years and is currently the education chair. Her number one priority is to make sure Shorewood history is accessible to the public. Shorewood, or Karen is also my phone a friend <laughs> when it comes to anything historical in the village and I am very grateful for her. Your primary presenter tonight is Jason Tisch. Um, Jason has worked with his preservation policies at the national, state, and local level since 1996. 
He has worked in the public and private sectors as a historic preservation specialist, architecture historian, and consultant, and has deep experience, in, deep experience developing and applying, applying historic preservation policies. He has degrees in geography, anthropology, planning, and landscape architecture. He currently serves as a certified local government and preservation education coordinator at the Wisconsin State Historic Preservation Office, mm -hmm. where his job is to recognize the unique objectives in each community and help people in those communities use the tools of preservation to meet their objectives. So I think Amy, now that we've gone through some introductions, um, what I'd like to do is maybe just ask our first survey question for purposes of tonight. Um, as all of you are aware who have registered for the series, um, we each session, we're gonna be gauging the public's interest in how they've learned about this series. So if you could just take a brief moment and let us know how you learned about the series that's occurring tonight. And just click on one of the options that's located in front of you. People are voting quickly, so I'll just be a second. <laughs> And Amy, we do have a couple of other polling questions tonight, don't we? Later on? Yep, they have three in total. A couple more seconds if people want to get their vote in, their answer. Okay, I think we'll end the poll here. Looks like most people who wanted to answer have answered. Okay. Wonderful. It is great to see these results. Um, thank you so much for everyone taking the time to complete the poll. Um, this information is just really valuable for how we seek to reach out to the public when we continue these conversations following the close of this educational series. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason, Jason Tish. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, and thank you to the rest of the team. This has actually been a really fun uh, series to coordinate with you all. Um, you clearly have um, strong feelings about your community and, um, and uh, love your community and its history. And that's, that's a great starting point for these conversations. Um, just one second, excuse me, Jason. I think maybe you're you're hitting your microphone with your hand, maybe when you're. Could be. Yeah, maybe my notes are laying. How's that? Is that better? Um, let's see. You're a little muted now. Let me check my audio settings. That's that's better. I think I just need to get closer to the mic. Is that better? There you go. That's great. <laughs> okay. Is this okay here? Yep, that's great. Okay, good. Um, yeah, it's been really fun putting this together with uh, with the Shorewood team, Kathy and Karen and Haley and Rebecca. Um, thanks for making this really easy to do and fun to do. <clears throat> um, my name. Oh, I'm going to share my screen so you can all you all can see my slides. Uh, share. There's always these technical hangups with these things, right? Um, and play, okay, can you see the screen, the slides? Yes. Okay, good. All right, here we go. <laughs> so my name is Jason Tisch. Um, I am the Certified Local Government Coordinator and the Preservation Education Coordinator for the Wisconsin SHIFO, that's State Historic Preservation Office. Um, we are located in uh, the Wisconsin Historical Society. We're a state office, <clears throat> but physically we're located at the Wisconsin Historical Society and we're part of the Wisconsin Historical Society. Um, so here's where we are located. This is our building on the UW-Madison campus. Um, and just to put, the, put our office into the broader context of the Historical Society, um, I thought I would kind of run through, where's my cursor, oops. 
Um, so the Wisconsin Historical Society consists of the state archives. Uh, the state archives collects the physical stuff associated with the history of Wisconsin. Uh, everything from folk art to sports memorabilia to corporate records. Um, uh, we have an Oscar Mayer Wienermobile. Um, the, Wisconsin, the Historical Society is also the library. Uh, the WHS library is the American History Library for the UW-Madison campus. Uh, and a depository library for uh, local, state, and federal publications. Uh, and we share these publications with the network, uh, statewide network of area research centers around the state. We operate uh, the Wisconsin Historical Museum downtown Madison on the Capitol Square, and we're currently planning for a brand new museum on the other side of the square. Um, we operate uh, 11 historic sites around the state. Um, including Old World Wisconsin, Pendarvis, Circus World Museum in Baraboo, uh, Villa Louis in Prairie du Chien, and others you probably know. Uh, we have educational services, online interactive resources, publications, research tools, lesson plans, archaeology resources, all related to Wisconsin history. Uh, we host uh, the Wisconsin component of, Mad of National History Day uh, every year in Madison for middle and high school students. Um, we provide outreach and support and networking opportunities for local uh, historical organizations and museums uh, statewide. We operate the Wisconsin Historical Society Press, um, uh, where we publish books for adults and kids on Wisconsin history, uh, quarterly magazine of, his of quarterly magazine of Wisconsin history, uh, mailed free to Wisconsin Historical Society members. Uh, we are the, um, the Wisconsin Historical Foundation. Uh, our office is, uh, operates on federal funding and some state funding, but we also raise money through the Wisconsin Historical Foundation to undertake special projects uh, and meet operational costs. Um, and, with, and, then, and then it's our office, the State Historic Preservation Office, where a state agency uh, federally established by the National Historic Preservation Act. Every state has a State Historic Preservation Office. And we work with communities, organizations, and individuals to identify, interpret, and preserve historic places in Wisconsin. So that is our office. Uh, in the first session of this three-part series, Karin, who we met earlier, talked about the history of the land that we now know as Shorewood. Uh, she talked about American Indian settlement going back 12, 15,000 years, <clears throat> um, settlement more recently by European immigrants in the mid 1800s, early to mid 1800s, and through the 20th century and the platting and the sale of land and <clears throat> uh, dense settlement by uh, people who worked in Milwaukee and were able to commute to um, to Shorewood, uh, enabled by the streetcar lines that were run from downtown Milwaukee north to Shorewood and, and uh, suburban development uh, north of the city. Um, and before we get into too deep into it, I wanna circle back on a couple of questions that came up uh, at the last, uh, during the last session. I mean, we didn't have ready information, but we, um, we've, we have some, a little more information on those questions. And I, I just wanna, I think it's worth some, um, some reflection uh, back on those questions um, because it's, a, it's an aspect of the area's history that has been uh, deeply hurtful to some people. Um, the land was the, the question came up uh, about the land purchase from uh, Indian tribes who were who were living uh, in this area, and the land was ceded to the uh, to the U.S. government by the Winnebago Indians in a treaty that was signed in 1829. The government did pay a 30-year annuity uh, in, to those tribes as a result of the, of the treaty, um, $18,000 a year for 30 years. Uh, the treaty also included some goods, uh, thousands of pounds of tobacco and many barrels of salt. Um, and this may seem like a fair trade given the dollar value of the time, um, but remember that the, the Indian way of life was, uh, did not really include currency. So there's not really much value in, in uh, to their culture except for trading with European settlers. And also the Indian way of life did not include the concept of land ownership. Um, and there's some historic evidence that Indian leaders were kind of puzzled by 
the offer to purchase the land um, and question the motives of European leaders uh, in making the deal. Uh, there was another question about deed restrictions uh, in the 1920s and 30s and 40s when, uh, when the Shorewood area was being um, subdivided and sold into residential parcels. Um, and there were deed restrictions on some of the subdivisions. Um, Kathy, I believe it was, shared some information um, uh, about some deed restrictions in some of the uh, some of the subdivisions. Um, and they were restrictions to keep some people out and to prevent them from owning from owning property. And uh, we I did come up with a couple of uh, restrictions that were enacted in some of these subdivisions. Lake Bluff number two. Uh, I'm not sure where that is. You might know where that subdivision was. Uh, there was a, a deed, a restriction attached to the deed that at no time shall any portion of said subdivision or any improvements erected thereon be occupied, sold, conveyed, mortgaged, pledged, rented, or leased to any person of Negro or Ethiopian descent. And there's another, uh, there's another subdivision called the Armory Subdivision, and the restriction in, in that subdivision was at no time shall any such lots or or lots in said subdivision or any building or structure thereon be built, erected, purchased, owned, leased, occupied, or used by any person other than of the white race. Um, so these histories are not unique to Shorewood. Many communities around the country nationwide uh, have these histories uh, to reconcile with. And those are community conversations that, and, um, that every community needs to uh, take into consideration and reconcile with. This session uh, is intended to clarify what we know about properties in Shorewood today, the way it exists today, and how we know it. Um, we know what we know about Shorewood and the history and the built environment of Shorewood from surveys mostly. Uh, and so what is a survey? Um, a survey has a couple of phases. Uh, first is a reconnaissance survey. A survey is, is basically uh, an accounting of uh, a, a, a brief look, a uh, windshield survey, a look at all the properties in a survey area and a brief evaluation of their eligibility as uh, potential historic properties. Um, the first phase of a survey is called a reconnaissance, a re reconnaissance survey. They're done by professional historians and architects. Uh, who look at every property in, in a defined survey area and make kind of a quick in the field evaluation <clears throat> uh, of whether uh, each property meets basic criteria for eligibility for the Federal Historic Preservation Program. That is the National Register of Historic Properties, Historic Places, sorry. Uh, and they look at uh, briefly in the field, they look at age and integrity. Uh, it's a pretty low bar and it doesn't mean that it's historically significant. They look at each building to, to determine whether it's old enough to be listed in the National Register and typically that's 50 years unless it has some extraordinary significance. And does it have its, uh, does it have integrity? Does it have its original design and materials? Um, it's kind of like, this phase is kind of like a metal detector. Uh, it tells you that there's something there that's the right material, uh, but you don't know how important or significant it is until you do a little digging. Um, and then there's the intensive phase of a survey. And this is when you do that digging. Uh, it gives you some baseline research on the area, uh, the survey area, the neighborhood or the community. Um, it tells you, uh, that kind of gives you the historic context of, of the area. Is, was it an industrial area? Was it a university town, a railroad town, a lumbering town, uh, a resort town? Um, so the, the research does a little research on, on the area and then on each property that, that is picked up in the survey, each property that kind of meets these initial criteria. Um, and they collect, <clears throat> uh, they find information on the construction date, the architect, if it was designed by an architect, the builder, the original owner, and they look for any important events or people associated with each property. And uh, so then a survey results in a survey report, which summarizes, this is a written report that summarizes the history of the area, that historic context, uh, and which properties kind of met that initial criteria <clears throat> that have some ability to illustrate or convey that history of the area. So what does a survey look like? 
Uh, it's typically a couple of people driving around a neighborhood slowly, uh, occasionally getting out and taking some photographs and then getting back in their vehicle and taking some notes on a clipboard or a laptop or a tablet. Um, and then going to a, a research facility, a library or a historical society and doing that baseline research. <clears throat> That's the physical, uh, what a survey looks like. Uh, surveys have happened uh, since the 1970s um, and early on in the 70s and 80s and even the early 90s, they were sort of haphazard done by avocational historians. Um, there wasn't really any standardized methodology. Uh, survey areas were often poorly defined or not really defined. Uh, they didn't have clearly defined criteria. And these early surveys often didn't look at properties uh, that were built after World War II. So post-war 1950s and 60s, those properties typically weren't on the radar of these early uh, surveys because they were pretty recent. Um, if, you're, if you're doing a survey in the 1980s and you're looking at 1960s properties, they're not really old enough to meet that initial criteria yet. Now we look at those properties. Um, and they weren't reviewed or vetted by our office. <clears throat> uh, they were just reported on sometimes survey cards, sometimes real simple reports. Um, since the 90s, mid to mid late 90s or so, um, surveys have been done by communities as a planning tool. Uh, often initiated by the local government, often grant funded uh, by uh, funds from our office. They were done by professional consultants uh, with a standardized methodology, reviewed and vetted by our office. <clears throat> and the results of these surveys can guide nominations to the National Register. They can inform local historic preservation programs. Um, they let you know, they let communities know what to be aware of and what the, what historic resources are out there um, and what they can use for things like making tax credits available, um, economic development, place making in a community, um, even things such as things like tourism marketing. If you're a tourism, a, a, a community that relies on tourism, you can use these historic places for tourism marketing. Uh, facade improvement grants. Some communities have <clears throat> grant funding for uh, commercial, uh, historic commercial buildings. Um, <clears throat> sometimes surveys are triggered by <clears throat> the involvement of federal money or permits or licenses. Um, there are uh, some, some, sometimes in these cases, surveys are required by federal law. Uh, when there's a federal <clears throat> uh, federal undertaking that involves money permitting licensing, um, the federal <coughs> federal laws require that um, the agency undertaking the project <clears throat> uh, survey the area, the project area for historic properties. And in those cases, it's simply limited to the project area. Um, so what makes a property historic? It depends on the evaluation criteria. There are federal criteria, the National Register Program, um, and when a, when a community has a local program, uh, they can develop their own criteria. They're, they typically tend to be along the same lines. Um, a lot of local programs base their criteria on the federal criteria, um, and those criteria are age. It has to be a certain age unless there's always an exception, right? There's a, if, it's an, if it's an extraordinary significant place, then it can be younger. <clears throat> but typically we look at 50 years for the age of, for, for being historically uh, significant. Um, integrity, uh, the condition of the building, does it look like it did when it was built or when, it's, uh, when the important event happened there or the important person lived there? Uh, does it still have its original design intent and materials and how much? Um, it can be important for uh, association with significant events in a community, uh, significant people who had an impact on the community. Um, and then there's another criteria for information potential. And this criteria is typically used for archaeological sites or shipwrecks. Uh, and this, <clears throat> um, this is a criteria that, that allows for um, properties where there's a potential to, to get informa historical information about a people or a shipwreck or, or uh, a, a certain technology. Oops. Um, 
So we're going to look at some of the surveys that have been done in, in Shorewood. Um, and there have been four that I've been able to find. And it's important to remember as we look at some of these properties and look at some of the survey results, that being included in a survey does not mean that a property is designated. Um, keep in mind that right now, as we speak today, Shorewood has 10 properties that are listed, that's listed in the National Register. We're gonna look at a lot of properties, but these are properties that turned up in previous surveys. Um, so there has been uh, four, four periods of surveys that, that I can, um, that I've been able to find in Shorewood. And we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna look through those and see what, what we know about historic properties in Shorewood. So 1980, uh, this, is one of, this was a very early survey and around 47 or so properties were identified in this survey. <clears throat> I didn't, I wasn't able to learn much about who did this survey, what was, uh, who, um, how it was done, how it was reported, what the criteria were, um, but it did turn up about 47 properties. We have 47 in our database that were added in 1980 as a result of some survey work. Um, uh, the, the, the folks who were in who were in Shorewood at the time may have a clue about who did this. I, I haven't uh, talked with, uh, with Kathy or Karen about this. Um, but if you have any clues about who was doing some survey work, then that would be interesting. Um, so almost all of the properties that showed up in that survey uh, are associated with Shorewood's development during this period as a, as a as development as a streetcar suburb of Milwaukee. Uh, it was probably an informal survey done by an avocational historian. Again, there's no clear pattern uh, to this survey. A lot of the properties are along Edgewood Avenue, Stowell Avenue, Newton Avenue, uh, North Lake Drive, and Capitol Drive. So it's kind of all over the, the village. Um, there doesn't seem to be any formal survey guidelines, and I don't think we, our office, had formal survey guidelines back in 1980. It's over 40 years ago now. So let's take a look at some of the properties that were surveyed during that survey, and these, these probably won't be any surprise to you. Um, this is the Benjamin Church House, uh, also known as the Kilborn Town House. This is from a very early period of development. And actually this property, this house was built in the city of Milwaukee and relocated to Shorewood uh, in 1938. It was built in 1843, uh, relocated here to Estabrook Park in 1938. Um, and this, this house is significant just because of its very old construction methods and very old design. Uh, this is a timber frame, post and beam construction. Um, and this, the, the church house is individually listed on the National Register. It was listed in 1972, so a really early listing. Um, and it, was, it is also <clears throat> a contributing property to the Milwaukee River Parkway um, listed on the National Register. The whole parkway system is listed on the National Register. And that was listed in uh, 2012. Um, at Atwater School on, on North Capitol Drive, built in 1915, associated with early development of Shorewood as that streetcar suburb. Uh, this was picked up again in 2011 when, when the 2011 survey was done. Uh, the Atwater Beach Bath House was picked up in 1980 during that survey, of course, uh, built in 1937 and of course demolished in 1987. Um, and again, associated with <clears throat> the development of public space and recreation along the lake shore as Shorewood grew as a, as a um, suburb of Milwaukee. Uh, lake Bluff School was picked up in 1980 on East Lake Bluff Boulevard, uh, 1924, designed by Alexander Eschweiler, a uh, prolific master architect in the Milwaukee area. And this one was picked up again in 2011. Um, this uh, double barrel vaulted stone arch bridge that carries uh, North Morris Boulevard into Hubbard Park. Uh, this was built in 1884 by the Milwaukee uh, Lakeshore and Western Railway to carry their <clears throat> railway line over, um, uh, over North Morris Boulevard and allow access from the village into uh, Hubbard Park. <clears throat> Uh, 
This is an interesting one that was picked up in 1980, <clears throat> the Shorewood Presbyterian Church. And this was picked up because of its architecture. It's uh, an interesting example of the craftsman style uh, of design applied to a religious building. Um, it's kind of an unusual design, uh, design choice for a church. Um, but it's, uh, it was also surveyed again in 2011, but this time it was just determined to be not eligible, I think, because it's, uh, it's uh, materials had changed. I think there's uh, vinyl siding had been, <clears throat> had been installed on the building by then, which uh, compromises its integrity. Um, it uh, hides its original materials, and so it was no longer uh, potentially individually eligible. <clears throat> Let's see, Shorewood Hospital on East Edgewood Avenue. Um, this was picked up in the 1980 sur survey, and of course it's no longer there. It was demolished in 1997. Uh, Casanova Apartment Building. Uh, this one shows up again and again in these surveys. You'll see it again. Um, on North Farwell, built in 1928. Uh, uses this uh, Mediterranean Revival style, which was used all over the village. Um, uh, you'll recognize this this style in, in um, residential buildings, commercial buildings. Uh, this is an interesting application of the style to a large scale building. Uh, this was resurveyed again in 2011. Um, the American Legion post on uh, North Wilson Drive was surveyed in 1980. <clears throat> uh, it was not resurveyed in 2011. I'm not sure why it was not picked up again in, in 2011. There's no notes about why it was not picked up. Um, it may have been changed since it was first surveyed. Um, and finally, this is the, the Walsh House at 40, 4430 North Lake Drive. Um, this was surveyed in 1980, uh, built in 1926 in this Tudor Revival. This is Eschweiler again, Tudor Revival style um, home on Lake Drive. Uh, it was picked up in the 2011 survey. And then 1993, um, around 39 properties are identified in this 1993 survey. Uh, this survey focused on this corridor along North Morris Boulevard and, and Hubbard Park along the Milwaukee River. And I suspect that it, this was clearly a, a, one of those compliance surveys where there's a project in the area and the agency doing the project has to do a, a survey for historic properties in the area. Um, <clears throat> it's so focused on this little corridor that that's that that it's <clears throat> it's obvious that that's what was happening here. And um, I was going to ask Karen if 1993 was about the time that they converted the um, the rail line to the to the bike path. Is that about the time that that happened? Um, I can't say for sure, Jason. Um, Certainly, it was during that whole decade they were working, beginning to work on it. But I don't think it would have been formidable enough to have that much of a survey. But um, we'll have to find an answer to that one. I'm not sure. Yeah, I was curious about that. I didn't know, but clearly there was something going on <clears throat> in this corridor where a federal agency had to do a survey here because in '93 <clears throat> they surveyed uh, this area. Um, and let's take, let's take a look at some of the properties that came up in that survey. Of course, the, the Hubbard Park buildings, the Scout Cabin, uh, 1936, built by the uh, WPA uh, in this rustic style. And the Women's Club building, also 1936, WPA. And then uh, a bunch of houses along North Morris Boulevard were picked up in that survey. Uh, this is the Kristen Karpinski house in this Tudor style, simple, simple Tudor style. Um, and a lot of these houses were actually not resurveyed in 2011, um, which is kind of interesting. I'm not sure why. Some of them may have had some alterations that made them no longer eligible. Uh, again, uh, North Morris Boulevard, this 1927 bungalow. Um, here's a duplex bungalow on North Morris that was surveyed. Um, another duplex in this kind of American Foursquare style. Um, a Dutch colonial revival picked up in that survey. And then of course the public works complex was surveyed in 1993. <clears throat> so you can, you can see that the concentration of where this survey was done along that uh, Hubbard Park, North Morris Boulevard area. 
And then in 2008, there was another, another one of these uh, federally required surveys done. And this was during the reconstruction of East Capitol Drive. Um, so that probably used um, federal highway funds to do that work. <coughs> and they would have, been, <coughs> would have been required to survey that entire corridor, that survey area for historic, uh, uh, historic properties that, that, uh, in, in the survey area. Um, and so that survey found 10 properties to be potentially eligible for the National Register. Um, so let's take a look at those. I think I have all of them up here. Uh, first there's the Allen Apartments, uh, built in 1929 um, in this Tudor Revival style, especially you can see that in the details around the door and the windows. Um, and I think, and, and all of these properties are on that East Capitol Drive corridor. Uh, the Rogorski Block, 1928. Uh, again, you see that Mediterranean Revival style applied to a commercial mixed-use building. Uh, St. Robert Church, the whole church complex, uh, built in 1936 and 38. Um, and then there were additions apparently in, in 1962. And this includes the convent and the school and the rectory. That whole complex is eligible. <coughs> Um, the Anison Apartment Building, this is a really nice uh, Art Deco design um, on East Capitol Drive. And again, <clears throat> applied to one of these large scale multi-unit uh, apartment buildings. Uh, the Morrison Apartment Building, uh, built in 1925. Uh, again, you see that Mediterranean Revival style. Uh, here's another apartment building. These are two identical buildings <clears throat> built as a pair. Uh, and they're eligible as a, as a pair of an, uh, to them making up in an apartment complex. Uh, and another, uh, another nice Art Deco design uh, at Capitol Drive in Oakland. Um, I'm sure this is familiar to everybody. The Armory Courts apartment building. Now it's the North Shore Apartments. This is a really nice mixed use uh, building on, on the intersection of those two corridors. Uh, Shorewood Manor. Uh, this is a U-shaped apartment building, again, mid, uh, Mediterranean Revival style. Uh, and I think that's, yep, that's it. So those 10 properties were uh, determined to be eligible uh, during that 2008 survey. So that brings us to 2009. Uh, and I'm told that there was a significant community conversation around historic properties and historic preservation that happened around that time. Um, so I want to take a pause in 2009 and take a look at where, where Shorewood was in 2009 leading up to that 2011 survey. <clears throat> so in 2009, Shorewood had 114 properties that had been surveyed. That just means they met those initial criteria and were picked up in a survey as being uh, old enough and having some integrity. Seven properties were listed in the National Register in, 20, in 2009. Um, and let's take a look at those really quickly. Five of them are, were, were nominated and designated all at the same time. And those are the Ernest Flagg stone houses. Ernest Flagg was a builder um, uh, who specialized in building stone houses in all, all throughout Milwaukee County. Five of them are located in Shorewood um, and all of those those Ernest Flagg houses were listed together as a multiple property listing in 1985. <clears throat> um, and five of them are in Shorewood. This is the Bossert House on Menlo Boulevard. Meyer House on Summit Avenue. Oops. And a couple of these I didn't have, we don't, we don't have photos for, so I had, to, I had to clip these from Google Street View. This is the Hatch House on North Prospect, uh, the Cords House on East Olive Street, and finally the Morgan House on North Maryland Avenue, 1926. Um, so those are five of the seven that were listed in the National Register in 2009. The final two are Village Hall, originally a school building, as Karin uh, noted uh, dur on the, during the last session, converted to Village Hall. This was listed in 1984. And finally, again, the Benjamin Church House, listed in 1972. So in 2009, 
Shorewood had seven properties listed in the National Register. Eight properties in Shorewood were designated as Milwaukee County landmarks. This is a county program uh, run by Milwaukee County that really has no protections and no benefits for designated properties. <clears throat> The county program says that it's purely for educational purposes that they designate landmarks. So there is no zoning restrictions on these properties and there's no um, grant funding <clears throat> or additional uh, benefits for these properties. Let's run through those really quickly so, so you're aware of what they are. Um, Anison Apartments again, that Art Deco uh, apartment building on Capitol Drive. Hubbard Park, the whole park is a Milwaukee, Milwaukee County landmark. And I suspect Milwaukee County um, has designated the whole parkway um, as a landmark. I'm not sure about that, but Hubbard Park is included in that. <clears throat> Benjamin Church House again. Um, and this arts and crafts house from 1916 on North Lake Drive. Um, the Lindemann C. John House. Um, also potentially individually eligible for the National Register. This house is individually eligible. It's in a, a potentially eligible historic district. Um, really, really fine example of the arts and crafts style. Um, and again, the Public Works Building, um, Milwaukee County landmark. Shorewood High School, the whole complex of five buildings is a Milwaukee County landmark and St. Robert Catholic Church. Oh, there's one more. Uh, the Vogel Passmore House, this uh, Georgian Revival house from 1923 is also a Milwaukee County landmark. So that's what you had in 2009 when Sherwood is having this uh, conversation about historic properties. Um, and that leads the village up to 2011 when uh, the village worked with my office to hire a consultant to, to conduct a survey of the entire village. Uh, every street, every property in the entire village was surveyed in 2011 by a consultant named Carol Cartwright. Um, and she did the reconnaissance phase and the intensive survey phase all at the same time. <clears throat> um, and she did preliminary, for the reconnaissance phase, she did this preliminary windshield survey to kind of get a uh, a visual sense of what's out there, every property in the village she looked at. Uh, then also for the intensive phase, did some uh, research looking at building records back to 1922, uh, local newspapers. Uh, I'm sure uh, Karen, uh, Karen and Kathy are familiar, were, from, were familiar with Carol at the time. They probably did, she probably did some research at the Historical Society. Um, so let's take a look at what that survey found, and then we'll kind of sum it up. Um, so Carol Cartwright uh, started out by looking at what's already designated and what's already determined to be potentially eligible. Uh, she confirmed those uh, seven properties that are listed in the National Register that we just looked at. She confirmed the eight properties designated as Milwaukee County landmarks that we just looked at. Uh, Carol confirmed the 10 properties that were determined to be potentially eligible in that 2008 survey along Capitol Drive. All of them were still there at, the point, at that point and I think they still are. Uh, she added one additional property to that potentially eligible list and this is, um, uh, this is, uh, oh, this is the American Bowling Congress building uh, on East Capitol Drive um, in this international style, built in 1953. So she picked up that additional property in, in, in addition to um, the properties that had been surveyed in 2008. Uh, Carol identified 57 houses, residential properties, um, single family or single family or duplexes, I should say. Um, survey of, of the thousands of houses surveyed, <clears throat> these 57 kind of rose to the top as the finest examples in their styles. <clears throat> um, so let's take a look at a sampling of those, not all of them, obviously, but um, this is a really strong example of a Georgian revival style, a style that was really popular in the, in that 
period of the teens and 20s and 30s and 40s uh, when Shorewood was being developed. Uh, this is on East Beverly Road, uh, built in 1928. <clears throat> uh, another, uh, another Georgian revival on East Olive Street, built in 1923. Uh, this was one that, uh, that Carol determined to be individually eligible. Um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, examples of the Tudor revival style. This is one of the finest in this in the village, um, and and again, only those that represent the the stylistic features most completely um, in their styles are are considered individually eligible. This one's on North Lake Drive, uh, an early house built in 1914. Uh, another really high style Tudor revival example on North Lake Drive. This one from 1926. Um, and here's that Mediterranean revival style again <clears throat> that we see all over the village. Um, this one's on North Lake Drive as well, 1927. And another Mediterranean revival example. Um, there's not many of these in Shorewood, not many of these in Wisconsin period. Um, the Spanish colonial revival style. This is a really nice example. Um, I think Carol, if I remember correctly, Carol found three of these of these houses in Shorewood. Um, <clears throat> uh, this one kind of rose to the top as, as the best. This is on East Edgewood Avenue. Uh, there are several uh, French provincial uh, style houses in Shorewood. Uh, she found 34, she recorded 34 in this style. This is on North Lake Drive again, 1925, and another French, <clears throat> French provincial example. Again, North Lake Drive. Uh, this one from 1931. So you'll notice the, the date trend in these is, <clears throat> um, I think all the examples that I've, that I've put up are from between 1914 and 1931 or 32. Um, <clears throat> so you really kind of see that heyday of development of, of Shorewood. Um, there's some arts and crafts and craftsman style homes in Shorewood. This one's again on North Lake Drive, 1918. Um, this is that sort of American Chicago st uh, style that evolved in the Chicago area. And um, uh, so this is one of the, the, one of the finer examples of that. Um, she looks like she found about 130 uh, homes in this craftsman style. <clears throat> and of course, this one again, uh, one of the finest arts and crafts houses in the village. Um, and then I wanted to show you a few of the modern styles. Um, these next few are not individually eligible, even though I have individually eligible up there. These, the next few are, are the best examples of their style, and I wanted to throw them in there just to, to show the continuation of, of styles um, after World War II um, <clears throat> and into the post-war years. And remember, these are not, el not individually eligible, but I wanted to show you just, just to, to kind of complete that, that line of styles that are present in Shorewood. Uh, this one's on North Morris Boulevard. This is a really nice international style influence uh, with some softening, um, uh, softened materials down at, down at the bottom uh, with this uh, kind of lanin stone material. It's not as harsh as a lot of uh, harsh or rigid as a lot of international style buildings are. Um, and then another another house that uh, we would call we kind of call this style contemporary, for lack of a more accurate or better term. Uh, contemporary style houses on East Kensington, uh, built in 1954, and of course the ubiquitous ranch style house. This one's on North Lake Drive, built in 1953. Uh, again, not an individually eligible, but in a potentially eligible historic district. In fact, I think these <clears throat> all these modern ones are in eligible historic districts, but not individually eligible. Um, so Carol found nine more apartment buildings uh, than had been uh, surveyed in previous surveys. Uh, this one's on East Marion Street. Again, that Tudor revival style. Uh, Mediterranean Revival again on East Beverly Road. Uh, she found four commercial buildings uh, that were individually eligible, including that funeral home on North Oakland and Menlo. 
uh, built in 1931. I, again, that um, Mediterranean Revival style. And here's Mediterranean Revival again, North Oakland Avenue at Beverly. Um, this is uh, a modest mixed use building. Um, she found uh, seven public buildings to be individually eligible, including again, those Hubbard Park buildings, the fire station, which looks much, much better now. It's a, that was a beautiful project. Uh, this is a, the photo she took in 2011 before the recent rehab. Uh, she found three church buildings to be individually eligible. Uh, this is North Shore Presbyterian on North Bartlett Avenue, uh, built in 1951. Uh, Luther Memorial Chapel at North Maryland Avenue, 1924. And Kingo Lutheran <coughs> on East Olive Street, 1957. Excuse me, I'm doing a lot of talking. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> she also found three schools to be in individually eligible, uh, including, of course, the Shorewood, uh, Shorewood High School complex, all of the buildings in that complex, <clears throat> uh, the Intermediate School, and Atwater School, of course. Uh, and finally, um, in that 2011 survey, um, surveyors also look for historic districts, <clears throat> and districts are collections of buildings that, while they, they, the individual components of them might not rise to the level of being individually eligible, the, the district, the area, the co whole collection of buildings um, has some ability to convey the history of a community or the history of that development. Um, <clears throat> and so taken together, these historic districts um, rise to the level of eligibility. So let's take a look at those. And this is a map that um, is the map showing up okay. Oh, I think it's a little off here. Oh, shoot. Well, I, th I think you can see the whole map. I can see the whole map. Um, so let's take a look at those, um, those eight historic districts that Carol identified. Um, we'll start up here in the northwestern corner of the village. This is uh, those Estabrook, <clears throat> Estabrook homes. This is a uh, post-war housing development uh, designed specifically for returning World War II veterans, kind of uh, developed as, as uh, contiguous uh, development. And they, you're all familiar with, with the, um, the aesthetics of those, of those buildings. They, you can tell that they were all built about the same time with the same design. Uh, Ardmore Avenue, uh, potentially eligible historic district. I'm going to say potentially eligible because, um, and keep in mind that these boundaries that are drawn here, and I think this is Kathy Keene's work, if I'm not mistaken. So we have Kathy to thank for this, uh, this map. But bear in mind that these, um, these boundaries that are drawn here are not, uh, not firm boundaries. They, if these <clears throat> historic districts were ever nominated to the National Register and designated, uh, we would look really closely at these boundaries to make sure to make sure that they do take in the properties that actually contribute to the district. So these are just rough sketch boundaries of areas that could be potentially eligible. <clears throat> um, so again over here on the western half of the village, northwestern corner is Ard the Ardmore Avenue uh, district. It consists of about 212 properties along uh, Ardmore Avenue and East Wildwood Avenue. Um, then we have, let's see, there's two really small districts here. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they're along uh, Oakland, is it Oakland Avenue, Oakland Boulevard? I don't remember, <laughs> sorry. Uh, they're along Oakland. One of them is up in the northern part and one of them, one of them down is, is down in the southern part. Uh, and she, the surveyor, um, designated these as Oakland North and Oakland South. They're very small districts. Uh, one is 10 properties, one is 22. Uh, and these, I believe, are uh, commercial properties. Uh, at least the one in the North, I think, is commercial properties. In the South, they, I think they're uh, residences. <clears throat> so two very small districts along Oakland. Uh, and then in the North, uh, on the Eastern half of the village, uh, along 
North Lake Drive, um, she identified two large potentially eligible historic districts. One she called North Lake Shore. That's this red one up in the top, uh, top right. And the other one she called South Lake Shore, uh, the one in the green boundary down in the southeastern portion. Um, those <clears throat> contain 307 properties and 220 properties respectively. Uh, and then there are two others. This one here, just west of North Lakeshore, is the Prospect Avenue District. Uh, that one has about 104 properties in it. And then south of there in the southern part is the Downer West, oops, Downer West Historic District. And that one has 125 properties in it. So a total of 1,013 uh, properties, vast majority residential, are located in historic districts that have been determined to be potentially eligible for the National Register. They're not listed, they're not designated in any way, uh, but they, they could be nominated and it's highly likely that they would be listed on the National Register <clears throat> if they were nominated. So, um, to sum up all of that, um, Shorewood presents one of its periods of history very clearly, and that is as a suburb, streetcar suburb of Milwaukee. Uh, settlement enabled by <clears throat> the extension of those streetcars uh, to the Shorewood area so that people could live in Shorewood, commute to jobs in uh, downtown Milwaukee. Uh, that very brief period of history uh, runs from about 1910 to about 1950. Uh, it was kind of the heyday of development. <clears throat> uh, it was characterized by rapid residential development, served uh, by commercial corridors along North Oakland and East Capitol, um, also served by the facilities of community life, the village hall, the fire station, schools, public schools, churches, leisure and recreation areas along the, uh, the river and the lakefront. Um, a lot of design and creation happened during that brief period. Um, Shorewood has a legitimate architectural pedigree uh, with a lot of master architects uh, from the Milwaukee area designing um, in dominant styles of the, of the period. Um, it's really a showcase of American architecture trends from the 19 teens, 20s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, there's a wide range of styles um, evident in a relatively narrow range of property types. Uh, we have residential forms, apartments, duplexes, single family houses, uh, commercial development, and mixed use commercial. Um, along those designated corridors, which um, typically served as streetcar lines, um, and civic buildings, the village hall, fire station, schools, parks and recreation. Um, Shorewood does not represent other periods of its history clearly. Uh, American Indian inhabitation, which is a much longer period, um, and there were very likely um, structures remnant from that period <clears throat> um, with Shorewood's location next to a, a body of water and that's typically where you would find um, American Indian structural remnants like uh, burial mounds and effigy mounds and things like that and there's really a, not a lot left over from <clears throat> Shorewood's period as a milling community um, that concrete production period or that, <clears throat> that period where, uh, where it was kind of a resort area and had uh, amusement parks. Um, so briefly by the numbers right now, Shorewood has 10 properties listed in the National Register. 86 individual properties are potentially eligible for the National Register. And 1,013 properties are located in potentially eligible historic districts. Um, that's a lot of eligibility, uh, very little designation. Um, and so in the next session, uh, next week, next Tuesday, I'm gonna be talking about, and we, we, we can get into this a little bit tonight if, if there's questions about it, but 
<clears throat> bear in mind that next week uh, on Tuesday, same time, same place, um, I'm going to be talking about um, the options that any community, including Shorewood, has for using these properties to their advantage. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll get into we'll get in deep into that next session. Um, but that's that's the content that I have for tonight. And um, we do have time, I think, for questions and answers and some discussion. So and I know that there's going to be a lot of questions uh, from this uh, in, intrigued audience, <laughs> judging from from the last session. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, talking more broadly about uh, about any of this with anyone uh, in, in, in this community. Um, it seems like you're in a good place for thinking about this. Um, so let's let's see what people are curious about. Hey, Jason, you know, I'm wondering, um, just to kind of set the stage for the questions that may come up, I'm wondering if we sure. could, you could just roll through our, our last two polling questions, because I oh, think it'd be interesting to see where, where the audience is at with some of these, with some of these questions. I'm going to stop sharing here so we can. Uh... So we can see each other. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'll launch question number two. Wonderful. Thanks, Amy. Oh, it looks like I made good time. It's 7.05. That's great. Yeah, well, I'm excited because I, 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 I think it'd be great to get some questions and from the audience, particularly before we start session three. But so our, our second um, polling question for tonight is what brought you to this conversation? Um, are you interested in learning more about the history of Shorewood? Um, interested in learning how to conserve Sherwood's historic places? Some of you may not want more zoning rules and historic properties. Um, others would like more information. And some of you may just be curious about the topic and some may have a completely other reason for being here, but we'd like to know where you're at so that we can help gear and answer um, the majority of questions, particularly in the third session. So we'll give it a minute there, Amy. Um, while we're waiting for people to answer, Jason, there is a question about, um, if someone knows where the armory subdivision is located that has the racial covenant, I would like to know. I know that Lake Bluff 2 is bordered by Lake Drive to Maryland Avenue and Lake Bluff, Bluff Boulevard to Kensington. So it sounds like we had a couple of questions about that specific topic and people were interested in learning more about that. I, um, I do not know where the Lake Bluff <clears throat> subdivision uh, is, but Karen might. Uh, the Lake Bluff, it's a small area, it's called Lake Bluff 2, and it's roughly in the northeast part of the village. Um, not exactly sure of the streets involved, but I think it's kind of south of Kensington um, and definitely east of Oakland. Again, a rather small area. There was one, another one called Lake Bluff One on the other side of Oakland, but uh, that one was on the uh, east side. <laughs> and the Armory one was right on the corner of Capitol and Oakland on the northwest corner. Thank you. So we will, Go ahead and share the results now of the second poll. Interesting, that's wonderful. Thank you so much to everybody who's participating in the polls. This information is really helpful to us as we proceed. You know, I'm wondering, um, because I anticipate a number of questions and because we specifically, I think in this session, talked about the architecture. I'd love to ask the, the next question mm -hmm. about sure. what people feel about Shorewood's architecture. So there's some options there. Some of you may feel that nothing's architecturally special. Um, I find that pretty hard to believe with maybe some of the composition of who's on the call tonight. Um, some of you may think that there's a few really exciting, significant buildings. 
Others may feel that there's some fancy homes on lake on the lake shore, um, but not much else. And then others may feel that we have an attractive collection of architect design buildings throughout the village. Okay, I think everyone has voted who uh, would like to participate in this poll. So we'll wow. share. Wow. <laughs> you don't see that often. <laughs> no, you don't see that often at all. I'm happy that I actually switched my chair position because the sun, I would not have been able to read that. <laughs> the results. Uh, that's as unanimous an answer as I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, as we get started, I think it'd be great to open it up to Jason for some questions. And Karen is also here um, for those that may be more area specific. So I see the Q&A. There are some at least a, one or two questions that rolled in. Um, Amy, would you want to start with the first one? you Sure. See? And um, so it looks like a lot of the questions are about what it means to be designated, what kind of impact that has on the property. Um, so we'll post those to Jason. I don't know if that's next week's presentation, <laughs> um, but we do have a lot of questions about that. Um, so first one is what is the downside of a property being designated a historic house? Uh, it depends on what you feel is a downside. Um, and remember that there are, I'm gonna, and I'm going to go into this in detail next week. Um, there are two, well, there are two main designations for any property. A, a property can be designated under the federal program, that's the National Register of Historic Places, or under a, uh, a local ordinance and many, many cities in the, across the country and in Wisconsin have local ordinances. They're all a little different. They're not uniform. They all have different, uh, different rules, uh, different uh, permitting processes. It's, it, it really depends on what the community wants to design for a local ordinance. But getting back to the national register, um, there's absolutely zero downside. I, even, if, even if you're skeptical, there's no downside to be listed to being listed on the National Register. Um, if you have a house that's listed on the National Register, you can burn it down tomorrow with absolutely zero penalty at all. There is no effect on your property taxes. There's no effect on your insurance. Um, there's absolutely zero impact for being listed on the National Register. No downside whatsoever. It's all upside. It is, the National Register is honorary. It's kind of a mark of distinction. Um, you don't automatically get a plaque to put on your house, but you can put one on there if you want to at your own expense. Um, you're, you typically are, have tax credits available, uh, federal and state tax credit programs. Um, uh, if you're, you know, when you're talking about <clears throat> um, uh, local designation, there can be some downside in that the, there's, there's a, an additional permitting process. There are just some additional zoning rules. Um, and we'll get into that in more detail um, next week. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Uh, but just remember that there are two, two different types of, of designation, national register and local. That is, that's key to remember when we talk next week. I think that your answer um, kind of answered a few questions here in the Q&A. There was a question about properties being torn down and whether that's allowed. Um, there's also a question about what makes a historic district historic? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, a district is usually a collection of buildings or properties, could be structures, that tells the story of 
of it, but taken together tells the story of an area. So for example, um, a good example might be a company town uh, like Kohler. Um, the, the town of Kohler uh, is a, a residential community that was built to house workers of the Kohler company. So that community tells that story of the Kohler company and the Kohler, de Kohler company developing the residential community for its employees. So any single house in Kohler might not be super interesting or super historic on its own, but that whole community together illustrates the history of the Kohler company. Um, so it's, it's a, a collection of properties that together convey some history of that area. <clears throat> Could I add something just in regard to Sherwood in particular, a good example would be the um, red brick apartments on Wilson, which have a story to tell about uh, the end of the Second World War when there was inadequate housing. And those were built uh, for returning GIs and were uh, rented only to returning GIs and their families until they were no longer in need. So there's a story that goes along with that particular one. And probably some of our other ones, the big ones along in Flake Drive, and whatever, the story would be what you've already talked about this evening, just building of a community in a very short period of time with very fine homes. So it, it has its own story behind it. I'll, I'll also add that um, in the case of Shorewood's historic districts, they are likely eligible for the range of architectural styles that they include. <laughs> so a historic district with, um, with a, a range of architectural styles can illustrate the architectural trends of a period. And that's very likely what Shorewood's historic districts are eligible for. Uh, so here's a good question talking about the surveys tonight. Is there a list of the 2011 eligible properties that is easily accessible? Hmm. <laughs> that, I, think, I think that's something that we could probably make accessible as part of this. Uh, there's a copy in the library. Uh, there's actually a copy online on the village's website. If you go to um, villageofshorewood.org, um, and look under plans and studies, you will see um, that study come up in that location. You can click on the hyperlink and that entire study is available for everyone to see. And that does include a, an itemized list of all of the properties that are eligible and all of the, um, all of the addresses in all of the historic districts as well. What it doesn't have, which I think is really unique from the presentation tonight, is that Jason was kind enough to show pictures of a lot of a number of the buildings that were listed. So in the survey itself, you won't see all of those pictures, but it does list everything by address. Um, there was a question about a Frank Lloyd Wright house, and has that been recognized? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna shoot that one to Karen. There is a Frank Lloyd Wright American System Built Homes, which is a, which was uh, Wright's. Sorry, go ahead, Karen. <laughs> you know more about it. <laughs> it has not been listed, and I I don't know what the uh, desire of the homeowners is on that one. Um, but it's uh, at this point, it has not been listed. It's recognized, obviously, by the community as a whole, but not listed. There's a question about the impact of historic designation on property values. Um, that's an interesting question. There, there is no automatic um, re react <clears throat> response in, in property assessments based on historic designation. That does not happen automatically. There is research that indicates that um, historic districts, whether they are listed in the National Register or locally, um, there's some research that says that that designation has a stabilizing effect on property values, and in some cases, an increasing, a positive effect on property values. Um, and it's not a direct result of the designation. It's just because there is some protection for the character of those neighborhoods that make them more desirable. 
and that tends to have a stabilizing or increasing effect on your assessment. Um, but again, it's not a direct result of designation. There was a question in the chat that I just wanted to highlight, and Kathy provided an answer about um, some resources maybe available at the Shorewood Historical Society. But Thomas was asking about how can they learn more about the architects and builders who were active in the 1920s and 30s, and where can they get more information about them? Karen, you probably know more about The Historical Society has some, um, some files on the various architects. There's quite a bit of information about those architects also in the survey. Carol did cover a lot of that as well. Um, and if you wanted to see what resources we have, you can email us at uh, showwithhistory at yahoo.com and we will try to be of assistance. We hope to have our office open to the public again within the next month or two, but at least we can give you some online assistance. And I think there, there have been a couple of questions um, about, you know, we, we focus a lot on architects and design and what about the history of the buildings? And is that significant? And is that something that's taken into account? Um, maybe more the social history of the buildings in the community rather than just the architects and the design? Um, a, build, a, a property can be eligible or significant for its history, what happened there, who owned it. That information is more difficult to get at uh, because that takes research and research takes time. Um, so when doing a survey like the 2011 survey <clears throat> that Carol Cartwright did, um, she did some initial research into the history of, of Shorewood and, and probably tried to connect it to specific properties. But often in a survey like this, uh, that history doesn't always get exhaustively researched just because it takes so much time. And, um, uh, but a, a building can be uh, designated or significant for what happened, who owned it, who lived there during their productive life. <clears throat> so it can be something that makes a building important, um, but it's harder to get it's hard to get at. And these surveys don't always capture um, all of that. I can give you an example that um, Carol gave us after she did the survey. Um, and you probably know uh, William Rehnquist, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, grew up in Sherwood. And he lived in three different locations um, in Sherwood. Um, and we've had people who live in those homes ask, you know, should my house be considered significant for that reason? And basically her answer was not really because he didn't do anything while he was growing up in Sherwood to cause him to be uh, a famous or whatever, but he was not a lawyer, he was not a judge at that point. So, um, you know, it's nice information to know, but it does not necessarily make an historic home. Right. Yeah, a building that's associated with a person is typically the single, building that they, the home where they lived <clears throat> during their productive life or the studio they used during their productive life or the office they worked in during their productive life. Mm -hmm. and there's typically one property associated with <clears throat> the productive life of a significant person. I think there was a question um, um, are we talking about national or local historic designation for the properties in Shorewood, or are we talking about both? That is a conversation that the community needs to have. We're not talking about anything. <laughs> um, the survey that I, uh, the, the surveys that I just went through, um, they are specifically they look at properties in light of the National Register of Historic Places, the federal program. Those are the criteria that, that <clears throat> consultants use for those surveys. Um, what a community does with that information, whether a community wants to have their own zoning, uh, zoning ordinance relative to historic properties is a conversation that a community has to have. It's not something that we will advocate for. It's not something that we, that is required. Um, 
So, so that's a conversation that every community has to have and, and Shorewood is just getting into that conversation. <laughs> yeah, and that's one of the great reasons why we wanted to bring this series to all of you is really to, so that everyone could first get informed of where we have been because we have such a rich history. And then in session three, we're gonna talk more about, and Jason's gonna lead that discussion about talking about some of the tools that may be available to us should we decide to move forward with any of those options. Um, but, oh, Kathy's joining us too. I'm here. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I saw someone was asking about, uh, for instance, if, if they're in a district that is eligible and do they have to be registered already before they could get the tax breaks? That's the kind of thing that we would take up next week. Yeah, we'll talk about the tax program. Go ahead, Jason. So we'll talk about the tax credit program next week too and how, how, how it can be used in Shorewood. <laughs> If that's something that we decide to explore, you know, I think at a, at a, at a minimum, you know, one of the things that I know has, um, Karen, you've been instrumental in, in educating me on and really getting me to see the passion behind how a community, no matter what structure it is or what you're looking to do, I think the Shorewood Historical Society um, has really just wanted to promote and share the history of Shorewood. And so when people do move here, regardless of whether there's one property designated or some properties designated, we really want to share the history throughout the entire village. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think is so powerful about the response we had with 97% of people, um, at least who are on this call, coming back to share with us that they find, you know, all different types of architecture to be valued here in Triplewood. I think that was just, that was invigorating to me. Here's a question um, from somebody who knows the architect of their home and they have the original blueprints. Are there building permits that are viewable online that go back to 1925? They're not viewable online, but they can be viewed um, with through the Department of Planning and Development at Village Hall. Uh, at least that's the first place you would ask. Uh, they have a file in every house in the village and uh, if permits were applied for, generally speaking, they have a copy of them. So that's, um, what's the, I don't know what the telephone number is, Rebecca, maybe you can uh, start with 847-2700 and ask for planning and development and uh, uh, they should be able to give you some information. And that's actually one of the, the uh, projects that we're, we're taking a look at right now because that is the most frequently requested public record that we have. Mm -hmm. um, our houses go back so old. And of course, you know, people, when they're looking to improve or also to renovate, that's one of the, the first go-to items. So we're, um, and tomorrow I'm actually doing some, <laughs> some detailed <laughs> estimates in, in terms of how we can cost out making those available online for everyone to access 24 hours a day. We had somebody curious about how many people are here tonight. We've had over 120 people here tonight, so a great crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, which tribe of Native Americans owned the land and now called Shorewood? The 1829 treaty that I mentioned was between the U.S. government and the Winnebago Indians. However, I'm not <clears throat> I'm not an expert in in uh, Indian Native American tribes and who associates with the Winnebago. Um, but I can tell you that it was between the government and the Winnebago. Mm -hmm. I think most of the things we have say Menominee, but that's probably part of the, I'm guessing that's part of the same group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Winnebago uh, encompasses a number of, of mm -hmm. self-identified tribes. A couple of questions about different types of properties. Jason, I don't want to quiz you on the survey. Um, <laughs> um, there's a question about Quonset huts, if we know how many there are or may have been, and um, whether there are any still existing farmhouses in Shorewood. Karen knows about farmhouses. <laughs> I also know about the Quonset huts. We didn't actually have any. We did have some temporary housing uh, after the war. I think Kathy 
is that correct? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, that was located uh, right along the river, mm -hmm. um, just south of Capitol. It was they were temporary, but they had they had V-shaped ro uh, roofs. They weren't faucet huts. Um, the farmhouses, yes, we have a number of farmhouses around the village. Um, majority of them are in the southeast corner of the village, although they're scattered around town. And the easiest way to identify them is to note houses that are not at the be the required setback from the road. Uh, mm -hmm. Things that are very close or very far from the sidewalk will probably, if not actually a farmhouse, built at a time when there were still farms here. So walk along Edgewood and you'll see half a dozen right away. So I think that covers um, most of our questions about you know, the survey and what types of properties we have. There are lots of questions that I think are going to be answered next week. So I will leave that to Jason and Rebecca if you want to take a few more of those or if we want to save those for next week. Um, up to you guys. What are you thinking, Jason? Um, I'm good for some more questions. It is 7.30. <laughs> I'm going to start dropping away, but um, I'm, I'm looking at the questions here myself to see which ones are uh, relatively easy to answer. John Krauss mentions Russell Barr Williamson, who was a prominent prairie school architect who worked in some poor wood. Hi, John. Thanks for coming to the call. <laughs> While Jason's reviewing some questions, I just want to um, thank also Kathy Keene, who joined us now on camera. Kathy has been a part of our work team um, and, and just a, a pleasure for me to get to know as we've gone along on, in developing the series and bringing this to you tonight. So I want to thank you for coming on camera now. Thank you. This is a passion that a lot of people share. And I think Jason's comment too about just surveying the village. Sometimes you just don't realize how unique it is. Mm -hmm. And uh, lots of places have their, their specialties, but now we're appreciating what Sherwood has. It's a pretty amazing collection of architecture. Yeah. And I hope, I don't know if Karen and Kathy can see this, but lots of comments in the Q&A and in the chat about how helpful you all have been and how nice it is to have such a such a great historical society to help out with research and archiving. Pleasure. It's a it's a team effort and lots of people who have come before us too who helped set up the society and a lot of interested people and our great village manager who's called this to uh, work with the board and everybody to see what we've got. Yeah, it's been fun to work and I'm looking forward to uh, uh, more next week. Yeah, it's going to be great. So just a couple of reminders for people. So each session you need to register for individually. Um, so if you haven't registered already for session three, go on to the Shorewood Public Library website and, and register for that. Um, I want to, before we leave, you know, I know that we've all been on the call, but the people who really brought this initiative to the forefront has been the village board. And they did so with the perspective that they were hearing a lot of comments. They were hearing a lot of comments that came in to the village manager's office. And um, there was great diversity in, in how those comments came in. And so this is, this is one of the things that I really value about being in Shorewood um, is that we have an opportunity to really take a look and get educated all individually and come together in some of these forums in order to um, provide feedback and assess what next steps do we take from here. Um, I, I don't have any idea of, of what it's going to be when it gets done, but I know that we're starting in the exact right spot um, with some really valuable people, not only the state, but locally who um, are just here with a sincere desire to promote our history. So um, with that, I wanna thank these groups again. Jason, thank you for a really thoughtful presentation on our 2011 survey, which I'm sure most people didn't know about. So I'm excited to get that document, as they would say, off the shelf 
into everybody's hands. It's also available on the Village of Shorewood website um, under plans and studies, and also an opportunity again to showcase the Shorewood Historical Society. Um, because I do mean it, um, you are a go-to <laughs> for me on a number of different topics. And they it's not every community that has a group like this. Um, so I wanna thank you so much for being here. And thank everyone for attending. We will see you again next week, Tuesday on May 11th. Take care, everybody.